Hello, I'm Chloe Cho and welcome to Investor Insights. Global equities are at 2016 highs on encouraging earnings and even geopolitical angst as that seen boosting the lower for longer mantra in global accommodative monetary policies. Here's a look at our headlines. As investors sniff the possibility of helicopters arriving in Japan, the speculation triggers huge swings in dollar yen and what that might mean for global sovereign yields. Wall Street's defensive rally faces another test this week with an onslaught of 91 companies reporting results. Plus, Trading Talents Asia Pacific unveils top six this week as two more are eliminated in the fourth finals week of the region's first televised trading challenge. Let's get insights from Jason Ambrose, managing partner of Vonda Research. Our judge of Trading Talents Asia Pacific, Angus Geddes, CEO of Fat Profits, and Mary Nicola, investment strategist and senior economist Asia of Aviva Investors. U.S. earnings season gets into full swing this week with 91 S&P 500 companies reporting results. Strong profits could fuel gains on Wall Street with the S&P 500 already up about 6% this year. Forecasts for the third quarter as well as the impact from Brexit will be closely scrutinized by investors and add to the renewed dollar strength. So the U.S. dollar picture has been pretty confusing with the outlook for the Fed uh, jumping up and down on the various economic data releases. It's not so much about other central banks, it's about the U.S. economy either proving itself one way or another and then the global risk appetite environment. Upbeat U.S. economic news has also helped take some shine off safe haven assets like gold, although the bullion remains well bid with prices up 25% this year. No move by the Bank of England last week has reduced the sense of urgency for the European Central Bank to act this week. A clear political landscape has helped the pound find a floor amid expectations for a great cut by the BOE in August. If we see the Bank of England and the government focusing on fiscal stimulus and steering away from too much of the rate cutting and especially negative rates, which I think is a non-starter in the UK considering the importance of its financial system, I think the pound bottoms out pretty quickly. We could see it actually rebounding. So short term we're looking at it lower versus, uh, versus the dollar as long as this 135 area stays intact. And I think the, the candidates for a turnaround to see sterling strength further out could be euro sterling, which uh, may, may top out not much further above its highs, and potentially even sterling Swiss, though I think some of the Swiss franc issue depends on how the EU tackles its uh, banking system. For investors chasing for an inflection point, attention shifts to the Bank of Japan's meeting next week as chatter grows that Japan might offer a macroeconomic policy of the last resort. Well, for the Bank of Japan ahead of the July 29th meeting, we certainly have great expectations on the policy front. The big, strong election victory for uh, the ruling LDP party in these upper house elections has the market looking at the potential for fiscal stimulus and even so-called helicopter money, which is effectively cash handed out uh, to the consumer in one way or another. I think the market may be getting a little bit ahead of itself and expecting this. I think the first thing we'll see is a reasonably sized stimulus measure. The market probably has priced in about a 10 trillion yen move. If we exceed that, we might see the yen a little bit weaker, but I think it's getting to be fair pricing after the yen was possibly uh, too strong. I'm looking at a range trade here for uh, at least for dollar yen and uh, possibly some of the other yen crosses seeing more yen strength coming in. Ahead of the big action in Japan next week, markets could be in a holding pattern as the outcome could signal a tipping point for global sovereign yields in light of the reflexive relationship between Japanese bonds and U.S. Treasuries. Given the significance of the big action in Japan next week, let's talk about market positioning with Jason Ambrose, managing partner of Vonda Research. So there's been so much that's been analyzed over what might happen, what might not happen, and yet can it still be a game changer? Well, it can be. It depends what you think about expectations, one, because we always it's, it's not getting things right, it's getting, it's getting expectations right where you make some money on these things, right? So. It can be. The problem that we have with the Bank of Japan, it's, it's pretty opaque. You know, that you've now got an expectation that's been built into the market about something fiscal, and whether mm. that something fiscal is going to be tied to uh, a bond issuance or a longer term bond issuance or not, because that makes a lot of difference. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's quite a lot of, I think, quite a lot of 
uh, expectation built around this meeting now. There's some people that still think that there's going to be a cut in interest rates in Japan. Right. Um, if you don't get a cut in interest rates, then that's going to be very significant for how you would want to view the banks. Mm. But it also has much broader implications to global risk. I mean, what's been moving, say, the US 10 year bond, and that's, that's the key benchmark risk for any for an asset manager. Um, what's been moving the yield uh, on the 10 year recently has been Japanese offshore Japanese buyers of US Treasuries. Right, right. And, that, and that's been prolific. It's mm. never been so big. Mm. So, you know, Japan is really, really important right now. Um, it couldn't be more important, actually, for risk. Does this make sense as to why Morgan Stanley is calling a bottom in U.S. 10-year yields next year, probably in the first quarter? They're saying 10-year yields, 1%. Is it because of this action that might happen in Japan next week? I, I, I don't know, quite simply. I haven't seen the research. But, but what I would say to you is we're in a very unusual scenario where flows are, are driving the back end of the U.S. bond markets. Mm. And if you know that flows are dry, that, that, that's something that's probably not going to get, not going to change unless you get a serious announcement from the Bank of Japan. So that's why this thing's so important. If 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 they come out and and give you more negative interest rates, or give you or give Japanese fund managers less reasons to think that rates at home are going to go higher. Mm then yields, quite simply, in the U.S. are going to stay lower. And, and yields will stay lower for an unusual circumstance. It will not be about U.S. macroeconomics. Mm. It will be about Japanese flows. So then th th this means that uh, this bond market bubble that's been talked about for the past couple of years, it is nowhere near bursting. I, I think calling the bottom of this is exceptionally hard. And, and we, like many other, uh, others, have tried to do that. But the, what I'm saying is the story has now changed. It used to be a story of if you got U.S. macroeconomics right, you kind mm. of had an idea where the U.S. 10-year would go. But now because of globalization or because of central bank policies or, or both, that doesn't count so much anymore. So mm. there's times when U.S. Macro, macroeconomics does count, but, it's, but the duration of those events is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Whereas flows never really used to count, now they account for nearly everything in terms of U.S. US and, and from market positioning perspective, does it make sense that what's been largely a defensive rally with utilities and telcos, telcos rallying 20 percent, this actually switches to risk on? I don't think so, no, because look, look quite simply, what moves cyclicals, the, the ratio between cyclical and defensive equities is, 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 is its relationship with US rates, mm. i.e. the 10-year. So if you've got an environment where the 10-year rates are still going lower, that tells you that the, the global fraternity is looking for carry. Mm. And if the global fraternity is looking for carry, then you're only going to see outperformance of defensive equities. What happens to gold? The gold is really interesting because there's two very different things that move the... Uh, gold is a function of real interest rates, and, and it, it does very well when real interest rates are low. So, so, so if you, you're in this interesting scenario now where the Fed, because of US data, it kind of wants to... It wants to go, it wants to raise rates because non-farm payroll, if you look at it mm. on a... Not on a last few print basis, but if you look at it over maybe a three or four print basis, it's been pretty good. US retail sales are good. You've even got the CPI that was, that was OK. Everything in US macroeconomics is good. So the front end of the curve, yields want to try and lift. Mm. But the back end of the curve is still being suppressed by Japanese offshore buying of US treasuries. So you're getting this flattening, mm. this flattening event. And when you get these kind of flattening ev events, it means a lot for everyone. It mm. means a lot for U.S. banks. It means a lot for Singaporean banks. It means a lot for, for all of the different connotations to risk off of the back of that, of, of that flattening uh, structure. All right, Jason, when we come back, we'll talk more about where EM stand amidst this volatility. But first, we're going to check in with Angus Getty, CEO of Fat Profits, when we come back with Trading Talents Asia Pacific. Welcome back. It is time for Trading Talents Asia Pacific, the region's first televised trading challenge. Let's find out how our top eight fared as they fought for a spot in final six. Top eight may have come this far after battling out more than 2,000 trading enthusiasts from the start, but two are facing cuts this week in Asia Pacific's first televised trading challenge. As stocks marched towards 2016 highs in a defensive-led rally, how did the final eight contestants trade volatility, manage risk, and change tact as markets move away from risk aversion? You need to be patient with the markets. The strategy has changed because uh, uh, what I have understood, it's, a, it's more of a day trading job uh, because of the drawdowns, uh, the constraint of drawdowns. And uh, that is why now, rather than taking positions for 
uh, a longer horizon. I'm just taking positions for a day. My strategy changed slightly. Initially, I used a bigger position on a shorter time frame, and now I'm using a smaller position on a bigger time frame. It's totally based on a chart. Execution is key. Being on the wrong side of a trade can easily wipe out the $10,000 US dollar balance in their live accounts with access to thousands of instruments from Forex, options, CFDs to futures. Two finalists are eliminated this week based on the judging criteria of net portfolio value, max drawdown, judges' scores, and cloud score. Up for grabs, the grand prize of $30,000 US dollars, another $10,000 for the runner-up, and $2,000 for the top weekly trader. Plus, five online voters voting for their favorite trading talent get to win a hundred dollars worth of e-vouchers each week. If you get caught up on any kind of one trade or any kind of one week, uh, you're just basically going to burn out. One has to be very cognizant of the amount of leverage that you're running at at the moment. It's very difficult to make money when everyone's moving in the same direction. If you want to be able to sleep at night, you have to hedge your long book somehow. It is time for Trading Talents Asia Pacific. So this week, we are about to unveil top six. Let's find out what were some of the winning strategies with Angus Geddes, CEO of Fat Profits, our Trading Talents Asia Pacific judge. So it's really interesting what happened. We had a dark horse emerging out of the blue. So it's Glenn. He took some really big risks. Standard deviation, close to 20%. Mm. Drawdown, nearly 50%. But his returns were looking pretty smart. But, I mean, is this the kind of risk-taking that you need to do, do at this stage of the competition? Well, I th look, I think for Glenn Tong, he had to take those risks. Mm. You know, he was at the back of the pack. He really had to come out with some, some pretty sharp sort of trading uh, strategies, you know, during the last week or so to catch up with the, the leaders. And he's certainly done that. So, um, but I think, you know, going forward over the, over the coming week, uh, whether he wants to be taking those, those huge <laughs> risks remains to be seen. Personally, I would be sort of taking the risk uh, down a little bit. Mm. But, but by the same token, I think the other two uh, leaders, Richard and, um, Rahul. and Rahul, uh, they've also been playing quite a defensive game, waiting for some of the other contestants to make mistakes. Mm. That strategy hasn't really worked either. Mm. So, you know, I think it's going to come down to risk management over the, over the coming week but also taking the opportunities where you can see them. Yeah, but next week is going to be a big one in light of the fact that we've got this huge, potentially huge action from Japan. So what kind of positioning do they need to take? What kind of tactical strategies do they need to adopt? Japan is going to be integral, <laughs> I believe, to getting this competition, to winning this competition. Mm. It's all about figuring out what the Bank of Japan is going to do. And, you know, I think this is where Glenn, uh, Glenn has had so much success. He's been long the Nikkei, he's made mm. a lot of money uh, in, the, in, the, in the wake of the, uh, the election result. And he's positioned and he's running into that. So, you know, I think you'll probably get a continuation of some of those trading strategies that he's been deploying. And some of the top contestants were also going long precious metals, but is that the right thing? Because right now, we're, that space is starting to look a little bit wobbly in light of concerns that maybe China might let go of its grip to support the commodity sector. Precious metals are looking a little bit overboard. Mm. They are overextended. And where we had that nice run and post-Brexit, post we might see the precious metals come off a little bit. I mean, we're still very bullish. Uh, you're going to have a lot of other issues coming out of Europe over the next two or three months. But as it relates to this trading competition, this next two-week mm. two window, um, you know, I'll probably be a little, a little bit more cautious on the precious metals. I could see them being sold off. And we've also been talking about this uh, contrast between those who are taking a more tactical strategy versus fundamental. Bloom Sang, for instance, for instance, he's investing more like a long-term investor yeah. taking, you know, a cautious bets. But right now, he's still in the leader pack. At the same time, he needs to make that leap to get into the top six and then top four. What are some long-term strategy like uh, in minded investors need to do in order to change tack? Well, I think it's interesting you, you, you raised Boon Singh because he's actually been very consistent. Mm. You know, every week we've seen that account balance increase. And so, um, you know, he's applying probably a, a reasonably conservative strategy, but if he can maintain that, 
you know, over the next couple of weeks, you know, it's going to put his account balance within proximity of the leaders. Mm. And we could well find that, you know, he's actually the dark horse that takes out the race. <laughs> yeah, it seems like we have a couple of dark horses. Let's find out who the winner of the week is and we unveil top six. The winner is... Unfortunately, we've had to say goodbye to Tracy Wong of Singapore and Kelvin Chong of Malaysia. All right, there you go. There you have it. Angus, thank you so much for that. I think we gave too many hints away while we were talking about the challenge. And by the way, folks, vote for your favorite trading talent at tradingtalents.saxo. And still to come, emerging market exuberance. Well, the markets are up more than 11% since Brexit. We'll talk more with Jason Ambrose and Mary Nicola of Aviva Investors. Emerging market shares have gained about 11% in a post-Brexit rebound and the hunt for yield in this low-rate global environment is likely to attract more inflows. Against the backdrop of a strong greenback and benign inflation, there are growing calls for central banks across the region to embark on more easing, especially China. Thanks to generous stimulus measures, the Chinese economy managed to grow 6.7% in the second quarter in line with its first quarter performance and slightly ahead of consensus. While the numbers look promising on the surface, private investment slowed to its lowest pace on record while exports didn't rebound. More easing is needed by the PBOC to inject life into the private sector, according to HSBC. While the region has been largely unscathed from Brexit, subdued exports among trade-dependent economies such as South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia and Thailand could restrain global trade over the next few quarters. Where should investors find value in emerging markets? Let's talk to Mary Nicola, investment strategist, senior economist Asia of Aviva Investors, and Jason Ambrose is still with us. So, Mary, Malaysia unexpectedly cut rates last week. Turkey followed suit. Of course, there was that coup attempt this week. So we're already in a low interest rate environment. Does this matter when policy just gets easier and easier? Uh, we still find value in emerging markets. Um, I think especially now with the Fed off the table, I think there's more and more value that is going to be found in emerging markets. How many countries now out there are yielding negative rates? Mm. So it just makes emerging markets even more attractive. So is it just how desperate investors are getting? They're looking left and right because the hunt for yield is getting so difficult. What does positioning tell you, at least from the uh, emerging market perspective? Ian was so heavily underowned given what happened with the dollar. Um, that the market really just didn't buy into it at all. So from a, from, a, from a positioning bias, no one had any EM, and, and that was our strongest call for the last six months has been to buy EM on that basis. Which EMs? Um, look, I think it, you have to be really careful with EM. Some are really defensive and some are really cyclical. So you, you also have to bear in mind how, what the global play is. So if you, if you have a view on US interest rates and that US interest rates are going to stay pretty low and, and everything's going to look pretty defensive, then again, I would, I would, I would err on, on caution within EM and just look for defensive EM kind of plays. So from my perspective as a, as a more global index guy as opposed to a single stock kind of person, you know, I'd be looking at any of the defensive indices like the, uh, like the Malaysias, like the Thailands, like the uh, Indonesias, these kind of markets. If you take a look at more of the trade dependent economies in Asia, they have been going through a two year recession. You've got households, corporate debt to GDP also at record highs. What does this mean to you in terms of investment perspective if fiscal and monetary policy gets easier? Obviously, does that add more to, uh, to a compelling case? Um, I think so. In some respect, you know, for, for example, if you look at, let's say, Singapore, Singapore for, is a triple A rated country and is still on positive, positive <laughs> yields, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's a, it looks very attractive from that perspective. Um, things like Thailand as well, you know, it, it, it still does also look attractive, even though it's at 1% or one, almost nearly 2% um, interest rates. And some of the lower end of the curve is nearly at 1.5%. So it still looks attractive. Um, from that perspective. What if you throw China into the mix? There are concerns that China it might be losing its grip or support for the industrial sector. That is starting to un 
unsettle the commodities market. The weaker currency is something else to contend with. Is that going to throw a curveball to some of the ENs? Um, I think generally we're, we're, we're positive on China in the sense of we think that no matter, even if the government can't achieve, uh, if the government has, has trouble achieving, you know, six and a half to seven percent, they will do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And I think the Q2 data showed that. So, for example, you look at, you know, the I wasn't very optimistic about the April and May data, and then come the June data, and it was great. Um, so it, it shows that if they're not going to meet. Uh, market expectations or they're not going to meet their growth target, they're going to give it that extra edge. The key thing though I think is that they're not going to push the accelerator button too much um, to create even more excesses. And the fact that the industrial sector is going through some sort of correction in China is a good thing. I think. But what about the weaker currency? We've already seen havoc at the end of last year and also early this year. Are we going to see a repeat scenario? I don't think you'll see a one-off devaluation like we've seen in the past. I think that created too much of a market of market havoc but if you look at you know just how how this the it's the currency's been moving against the basket it's been slowly depreciating and that's 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 a good thing for china in quick terms thoughts of on china jason yeah, I, I think much the same. I think that the, the, the story around China and the real sort of touristy story of last year was based upon outflows. Mm. So, so if you're Chinese and you want money out, the US 10 yield is giving you a much less appealing rate or you can go to the UK and you just took a 13, 15% hit on your currency or there's not that many better alternatives. Yeah. So look, as much as money will always want to, see, it's, to come out of China for China's sort of idiosyncratic reasons, I think there's less pressure on that mass exodus, which is the Taliban. Mary, Jason, really appreciate it. We'll see you again very soon. Thank you. And let's take a look at our question of the week. Before we go, here is our question of the week. Will Japan unleash helicopter money next week? Tweet me at Chloe Cho TV or email us at InvestorInsights at MediaCorp.com.sg. And that's our show for this week. I'm Chloe Cho signing off on behalf of the entire team. Remember to tune in next week. Trading Talents Asia Pacific unveils top four, and you certainly don't want to miss it.